Welcome to First Baptist Sparta, and thank you for watching our worship service online. We hope that the hearing of the Word today leaves your faith strengthened and encouraged, and we hope that you'll make plans to come visit us in person soon. For more information about the church, you can either contact the church directly or visit spartafirstbaptist.com. If you've got your Bible, you can open it up to Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6, we're going to be in verses 8 through 15 this morning as we continue our study through the book of Acts. I watched Colby's sermon last week, and he made a joke about how it would be nice to take a break from the book of Acts. Well, I'm sorry, we're back. No more breaks, right? Uh, thank you to, uh, to Colby and uh, Cindy and Sharon filled in on the piano for Tammy. Thank you to everybody uh, for uh, making things happen as we work on. Uh, Acts chapter 6. Verses 8 through 15, the last time we were together, we saw in the first half of Acts 6 that the church appointed seven men, and it was seven men who specifically fit a certain criteria. They were men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit, and full of wisdom, and they were appointed to oversee the distribution of the resources of the church to the widows who were in need. Now, two of those seven men who were named in that passage were Stephen and Philip. And for the rest of chapter 6, all of chapter 7, and the beginning of chapter 8, Luke is going to fill us in on the specifics of the ministry of Stephen and Philip. Not only were they deacons in the church who were serving the widows, but they were also involved in powerful ministry in the life of the early church. And the significance of these two men, Stephen and Philip, is this. They're not apostles. They don't have the same status. They don't have the same authority as Peter, James, and John, and the rest of the twelve. Stephen and Philip are what we might call normal Christians. But what they show us is that the mighty ministry of the church isn't limited to a select group of people with special status. The mighty ministry of the church isn't reserved for the Billy Grahams, and the Adrian Rogers, and the Lottie Moons, and the Annie Armstrong. Now, the mighty ministry of the church is for all believers, including each and every one of them. So stand, if you will, and honor the reading of God's word. Acts chapter 6, verses 8 through 15. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Cyrenians, and of the Alexandrians, and of those from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Then they secretly instigated men who said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people, and the elders and the scribes. And they came upon him and seized him and brought him before the council. And they set up false witnesses who said, This man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. And gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Let's pray. God, this is your word. Pray that you'd help us understand it, not just what it means, the text in front of us, but what it means for our life, and that you would help us to see that everything in all of history points to Christ. So may our lives as well point to Christ. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Here's the main idea of the, the passage today. We cannot be satisfied by the empty forms of religion. When Christ, the reality, has come. We cannot be satisfied by the empty forms of religion when Christ, the reality, has come. Now I'm going to ask you to do something that none of us like to do in church. All right? Let's be honest. You don't have to raise your hands. You ever get bored with church? You're like, yeah, the next 40 minutes. Maybe only 30 today. Maybe. We'll see. You ever get bored, stagnant with reading your Bible? 
You ever get bored, disinterested in prayer? What I hope we'll see from the passage this morning is that when we begin to get bored with the forms of religion, it's because we're not using those things and seeing those things for what they actually are, which is avenues of experiencing Christ. Last week in Greece, our mission team was being led around the city on a prayer walking tour. So, for instance, we would, we would go and see this great, big, beautiful Greek Orthodox church. And the local missionary would explain some of the history and background of the church, and, and we would stop as a team and we would pray for reformation in the Greek Orthodox church. We'd pray for people to have their eyes open to the reality of Christ, not just the religious symbols around them. And then we walked onto the college campus in the city, and we stopped and prayed for the faculty and the students, that, that God would do a work among them, bringing revival to a, a generation of college students in this part of the world. And then we walked to a government building where we, we learned about the corruption, sound familiar, that fills all the government leaders in the nation of Greece, and we prayed that God would bring honest people of integrity to serve the people of Greece. So we're on this prayer walking tour, going around the city, praying for the city, and, and as we are on this tour, we get to the popular touristy area of the city. And as all of you know, who've traveled internationally, wherever there are lots of tourists, there are lots of street salesmen trying to take advantage of them. Now one of the guys who was with us was a Greek. He was a member of the partnering church there uh, in Greece, and he was wearing some really nice Ray-Ban's sunglasses. I know Ray-Ban. He got them as a, a birthday present from his friends. Now, if you don't know, Ray-Ban's are very expensive. They're really nice sunglasses. They cost between $150 $200 a pair. So as we're standing there in the circle talking, the street salesman inserts himself into our circle, and he's selling fake Ray-Ban's. Now, they look real, right? They've got, this, they've got a logo on the sides in the same spot, and they look similar to actual Ray-Bans, but they're not. They're knockoffs, right? They're fakes. And so the salesman kind of weasels his way into our circle, and he asks if anyone wants some sunglasses. And our Greek friend looks at the salesman. He points to the logo on his glasses, and he says, no, 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 no. I got the real thing. <laughs> now, this is what Stephen is saying to the Jews in the passage. The temple, the law, the Old Testament traditions, those were forms of religion that were foreshadowing Christ. They were symbols pointing to the real thing. But because Christ has come, the real thing is here, so the symbols and the shadows are no longer needed. So the Jews are, are arguing with Stephen. Here's how you get near to God. Here's how you know God. Temple, animal sacrifices, food restrictions, and special washings for purification. That's what it means to know God. And Stephen says, no, 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 no. Those are knockoffs. Those are fakes. Jesus has come. I got the real thing. So point number one. The preeminence of Jesus Christ is hard to argue with. The preeminence of Jesus Christ is hard to argue with. Verse 8. And Stephen full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. So notice that the miraculous powers of the Holy Spirit aren't limited to Peter and the apostles during this time. Stephen, like Peter, is doing great wonders and signs among the people. This likely includes miracles of healing, like we saw Peter do in chapter 3, where he healed the crippled man outside the gates of the temple. And, and this should have been the first evidence that Stephen was worth listening to, right? You see people doing many signs and wonders in the name of God by the power of the Holy Spirit. His arguments, his teachings are worth listening to. But verse 9 tells us that these signs and wonders were insufficient evidence for the Jews that Stephen was interacting with. And we see in verse 9 that they take issue with not just the signs, but his teaching as well. It says... Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Cyrenians, and of the Alexandrians, and of those from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen. So you have all these different people in all these different groups. I'm not going to run through them all, 
But it's just, these are different countries and regions in the surrounding area. If you remember from Acts chapter 6, when the dispute broke out within the church, it was between two groups, the Hebrews and the Hellenists. The Hellenists are the Jews who have moved back to Israel from these surrounding nations, like the ones listed in verse 9. So Stephen, we know from his name, he is a Hellenist Jew, he's a Greek Jew, and he's going to these Hellenist synagogues trying to persuade them that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah who has come to bring salvation. Now, how would Stephen do this? What, was he, what would he go into the synagogue and do? How would he teach? We, we don't know for certain, but it's not hard to imagine. I think that Stephen would go up into the synagogue and he would roll open the scroll to Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, and he would say something like this. Do you remember, people of God, Jewish people, do you remember how God promised to give Abraham a special offspring, one who would bless all the nations of the earth? And the Jews would say, of course, Genesis 12, 3, Abraham will have a special offspring who will bless all the nations of the earth. And then I think Stephen would take another scroll and open it up to 2 Samuel 7, and he would say something like this. Do you see, 2 Samuel 7, how this special offspring of Abraham would also be a descendant of David? And they would say, yes, of course, the Messiah would be a, a descendant of David. And then he would open up the scroll, another scroll to Isaiah 35, and he would, see, he would say, do you see how when the Messiah comes, he's going to make the blind see? The deaf hear, the lame walk. They say, yeah, 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 we see it right there. And then he would go to Isaiah 53. And he would say, say, do you see how the Messiah, the Lord's special servant, will be pierced for our sins and crushed for our transgressions? And then they would probably do a double take and say, what? The Messiah is going to do what? And he would say, yeah, look, right here, Isaiah 53. So Stephen would take them through the, the Old Testament, looking at the promises of the Messiah and the descriptions of the Messiah. And you can imagine this big crescendo moment when Stephen would finally say, a man has come who has fulfilled all of these promises and descriptors. And his name is Jesus of Nazareth. He's Jewish like us. He's a son of Abraham. He's a descendant of David. Look at his lineage. Look at his genealogy. When he was here, he did many mighty miracles. He made the blind see and the deaf hear, just like Isaiah said he would. And just a few weeks ago, here in Jerusalem, they crucified him, just like Isaiah prophesied. And he even warned his disciples beforehand. He knew it was coming. He said it had to happen so that forgiveness of sins could come. And not only was he crucified, but he rose again three days later. His disciples watched him. And his disciples are, are here in Jerusalem now. You can ask them. They watched him ascend into heaven to reign on his heavenly throne as David's king. It would be a pretty fascinating Bible study, would it not? But it would also be an unsettling Bible study. Have you ever gone through a Bible study or, or a devotion before and it just didn't sit right with you? It was a little bit outside of what you were used to hearing. It was a little different than the traditional teaching that you grew up with. And so you're a little skeptical and suspicious about what's being taught. Well, that's what was going on with the Jews that Stephen was teaching. Because not only was Stephen saying, the Messiah is here, and his name is Jesus of Nazareth. That wasn't overtly controversial. What was controversial was this. Because the Messiah has come, everything has changed. The old forms of Judaism are gone. The temple, no longer needed. The priesthood, no longer needed. The sacrifices, no longer needed. Aspects of the law have changed. And everything about how we relate to God has changed. The curtain is torn in two. And the Jews were just like good church people today. Very skeptical of change. Verse 14 describes how they viewed Stephen's teaching. It says, we have heard him, talking about Stephen, 
We have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place, talking about the temple, and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. Now we're going to come back and explain this in just a minute, but for now, here's the point. They didn't like what Stephen was saying. Right? It felt threatening to them. It felt like false teaching. It'd be like coming into a Baptist church and saying, we're not doing any more food fellowships. <laughs> like, you're heretic. <laughs> In verse 11, it says they accused him of blasphemous words. And so verse 9, not surprising, they rose up and disputed with him. But in the midst of their disputes, there's a problem. And it's in verse 10. They could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. You know the saying, the truth is on our side? Well, the truth was on Stephen's side. Stephen wasn't threatened or agitated or thrown off by their disputes because the truth was on his side. And when you have the truth, there is nothing that can move you off of it. I remember being in elementary school and I got called into the principal's office over some shenanigans on the playground. I was the kind of kid that hated getting in trouble. My heart would skip two beats every time I got called in for questioning. But on this particular occasion, I was cool as a cucumber. You know why? Because I knew exactly what had happened, and I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> the truth was on my side, and the truth will set you free. So as Stephen debates with them, they can't argue with him. They can't argue with the scriptures. Jesus of Nazareth really is the Messiah. And he's the fulfillment of the temple and the law. They know that Stephen's getting the best of them in the argument. They know the evidence is mounting against them. And if you've ever experienced it, you know it's a terrible feeling when the evidence is overwhelming against you, but you don't want to admit it. All the pride of our falsely held beliefs keeps us from admitting what we know is true. And this points to an important principle as it relates to, to faith in Christ. We saw it over and over again in Jesus' ministry. Evidence is an issue, but it's not the core issue. They knew in their heads, Stephen is right but they refuse to submit to it in their hearts. That's why you will never convince someone into heaven. You will never argue someone to Christ. Because the intellect isn't the primary battlefield. It's the heart. The primary question of Christianity isn't what do you know? It's what do you love? It's a heart of humility. It's a heart of surrender. It's a heart of love for God. And so when they can't win the argument against Stephen, how do they respond? The same way we do when we can't win an argument with our spouse. They get mad. And not only do they get mad, they get personal. When I was reading this, it, it unfortunately reminded me of the current political climate. We have transitioned away from debating issues and ideas. And now we just attack individuals. We do this in marriage too. When there's conflict, we attack the person, not the problem. Why do we do that? Because when we can't win the argument, the only way for our pride to stay intact is to make ourselves feel superior by insulting the other person instead of solving the problem. And that's what happens to Stephen. They can't withstand his wisdom, so they attack him personally. Point number two. The preeminence of Jesus Christ threatens our traditions and traditional forms of worship. Verse 11. Then they secretly instigated men who said, we have, heard, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and seized him and brought him before the council. And they set up false witnesses who said, this man never ceases, talk about some exaggeration, this man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law, for we have heard him say, this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs Moses delivered to us. Now, the reason I read that whole section together is this. What series of events does that sound like? Anybody? 
Jesus. This is exactly what happened to Jesus. They make a secret plot. They accuse him of blasphemy. They set up false witnesses. And eventually they condemn him to death. Now the accusations of blasphemy against Stephen are slightly different than those that were made against Jesus. Right? The, the main issue with Jesus is that he claimed to be God. But these accusations against Stephen have to do with two main categories. The temple and the law. They said, this man never ceases to speak words against this holy place. It's a reference to the temple. They talk about how he opposes Moses and he opposes the law. So what is Stephen saying? This is a question. What is he saying that makes them believe that he's against the temple and against the law? They say, we have heard him say that Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place. So question, did Jesus ever personally say that he would destroy the temple? No. No. And that's what makes them false witnesses. At best, they're misunderstanding what Stephen is saying. At worst, they're intentionally twisting it. In reality, Jesus had said two things about the temple, and, and Stephen is reiterating them. The first is in John 2.19. Where Jesus did say this, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Now as obvious to us, not so obvious to them, what was Jesus talking about? His body, his own body. But they thought in the moment that he was talking about the actual temple. In fact, they respond to him saying, it has taken us 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? Now, why does Jesus refer to his body as the temple? What does the temple represent? The presence of God. You go into the temple, you go into the holy place to meet with God. And Jesus is saying, through my death and resurrection, the curtain of the temple is torn. Access directly to God has been granted to everyone who comes not to a place, but to a person, Jesus Christ. Amen. So there's no more need of the temple. Because the function of the temple has been replaced by Christ himself. The ritual has been replaced by the reality. <clears throat> it's through Christ that we enter into the presence of God. It's not through the temple. It's not through the priests. It's not through the sacrifices. Jesus came to be the better temple, better priest, better sacrifice. So it's through him that we draw near to God. But that's not the only thing Jesus said about the temple. He also said in Mark 13, 2, as he's walking around the temple complex with his disciples, he looks at them and he says, Do you see these great buildings? The temple? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. So Jesus doesn't say he will destroy the temple, but he does say a day is coming where the temple will be destroyed. And it was a prophetic pronouncement because in 70 AD, Rome would come and flatten Jerusalem, including the temple. And this was God's judgment on Jerusalem for rejecting their Messiah. And it was the end of Judaism as they knew it because the temple has never been rebuilt and not one more sacrifice has been offered there. So Jesus, both spiritually and historically, replaced the temple. And like our friend in Greece, why would you settle for the knockoff when you can have the real thing? Why would you settle for a building where you can't even get into the holiest place when Christ offers full access to the presence of God and we're invited to approach the throne of grace with confidence? Now, not only is that true for the temple, it's also true for the law. They accused Stephen of opposing the law of Moses. Now Jesus himself is so concerned about being misunderstood on this point that he explicitly teaches in Matthew 5.17, Sermon on the Mount, Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to do what? Fulfill them. Fulfill them. Jesus and Stephen, they're not opposed to the law of Moses. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law of Moses. And here's what that means. 
The law said to be holy and pure, you can only eat certain foods. Praise God, that's over. We need all the steak we want. The law said to be clean and, and pure, you have to fulfill purity rituals. The law said to be forgiven, you have to sacrifice certain animals. And these were all symbols and, and rituals that represented the holiness of God and the purity of God's people. But the problem with the rituals was this. The rituals only worked on the outside, not the inside. So even the most rigorous Israelites who obeyed the law to the best of their ability, they could never deal with the true fundamental problem of the human heart, sin. They could feel good about themselves religiously, but they could never deal with the problem of sin. And so again, why would you settle for the knockoff when you can have the real thing? Why would you settle for imperfect obedience through your own efforts to obey the law when perfect obedience is available to you through the work of Christ? Now it's easy for us to look at these first century Jews and just think that they are so silly. Why would you cling to these rituals and traditions? And yet even though the, the forms of religion have changed, from the first century Judaism to 21st century Christianity, we are just as susceptible to this as they are. We can hold on to certain rituals and traditions or certain forms of religion that obscure the reality of Christ. That's the problem, right? Christ has come to replace the temple, but you're still using the temple. So that's obscuring the reality of Christ who has come. And we can do the same thing, using our traditions and rituals to obscure the reality of this. Something that was really interesting to me and refreshing to me on our trip to Greece was this. On Sunday morning for worship, we met in a coffee shop, not a sanctuary. We sat around tables and in lounge chairs, not pews. Can you all imagine if you came in next Sunday and there were no pews? My goodness. I'd be looking for a new church. <laughs> Jonathan was asked on Saturday night at 9 o'clock to preach the sermon for the next day. And he preached it from a barista bar, not a pulpit. Midway through the sermon, the pastor there told Jonathan to stop preaching and answer questions. <laughs> Y'all like that? Just make it longer. Uh, at the end of the sermon, he told him to stop again and answer questions. Everything about it was so different from what we've become accustomed to in our Western weekly worship. But guess what? It didn't matter how different it was. Why? Because it was all about Jesus. No pews, no, no pulpit, not a traditional sermon, just 20 people in a coffee shop, but all about Jesus. The foundation of the church isn't the, the rituals or the traditions. It's not the forms of religion. It's about Christ. He is our foundation. He is the cornerstone of our faith. But then to think about some of the ridiculous stories you hear out of the American church. I was talking to someone this week and they were telling me about a church. This was a long time ago. But the church bought a deacon bench for the sanctuary. I don't even know, I don't even think I know what a deacon bench is. But they bought a deacon bench. And the church split over where it would go in the sanctuary. One of the missionaries we met last week told us about his church in Texas. He was like, this is not a, a joke about the stereotype. It's real. Our church split over the color of the carpet. There are churches that split over music. Churches that split over paint. Churches that split over what time the service should be. Churches that argue over this, that, and the other, while the message of Christ is obscured and overshadowed by the forms of religion, rather than focusing on the reality that those forms point to. God help us that we never get more preoccupied with our building than we are about Jesus. That we never get more preoccupied with the style of music than we are about Jesus. Jesus that we never get more preoccupied with a particular translation of the Bible 
than we are about Jesus. Amen? Jesus is preeminent. Jesus is top. Nothing above him. And so if we as a church need to tweak our forms in order to clarify Christ, we should be eager to do it. Now, can I give you a hypothetical? It's a test. <laughs> the sanctuary and the parking lot, by God's grace, are filling up. And I don't know what to do when we hit the tipping point other than go to two services. If you've got $5 million to build a new sanctuary in this economy, talk to me after the service. <laughs> but other than that, I don't know what to do if we get to that point. But here's what I do know. We're not going to turn people away from the worship service. If people want to hear the gospel, if people want to know Christ and experience the Holy Spirit among us, we have to make space for them to do that. So if we get to that point of requiring two services, we'll just figure it out. I don't have a plan. <laughs> we'll figure it out. But we have to, right? Because Christ is preeminent over our personal preferences. So here's a question and application today. Are you pursuing the reality of Christ or the empty forms of religion? Are you pursuing the reality of Christ or the empty forms of religion? Back at Christmas time, I know you all remember my sermons so well, you can go all the way back to Christmas. <laughs> back at, at Christmas time, we looked at the story of Simeon from Luke chapter 2. If you remember, Simeon was a righteous man, he was a religious man, he kept the law. But the main thing about Simeon is that it had been revealed to him that he would not see death until he had physically seen the coming of Christ. And so every day, you can imagine, Simeon is going to the temple, doing what all the Jews typically did, going to the temple multiple times a day for times of worship. But every time Simeon went to the temple, he wasn't just going to the temple. He was going to the temple looking for Jesus. He went in hopeful expectation, in joyful anticipation of meeting the Christ the Redeemer of Israel. Now at that time in Judaism, when people went to the temple, that they were just going to the temple. They were going to fulfill a, a ritual or a, a religious obligation. But Simeon went to the temple looking for Jesus. And I think that there's an attitude there worthy of emulation. In our American Baptist context, and, and believe me, I am in it. I'm the son of a Baptist pastor. I believe Baptist. I'm guilty of doing what I'm about to tell you not to do. But in our American Baptist context, it is so easy to treat religious duties as the point of Christianity, as the end game, as the final destination. What does it mean to be a Christian? Well, it means you go to church and you have a daily quiet time. It means you join a Sunday school class, you tithe. That's what it means to be a Christian. You fulfill your religious obligations. And so we measure the depth of our spiritual life by faithfulness to these religious duties, not realizing that these religious duties aren't religious duties. That's not what they're there for. They are avenues of experiencing the reality of Christ. They are to point us to Christ. So you don't read your Bible out of religious duty. You read your Bible like Simeon went to the temple in joyful expectation of meeting with Jesus. You don't go to church out of religious duty. You go to church to get more of Jesus. You don't go to Sunday school to fulfill your obligations, religious obligations. You go to Sunday school to get more of Jesus. These aren't items to check off of a list. They are buckets that plunge us deeper into the well of living water. So like Simeon, Go to church, read your Bible, pray, but look for Jesus. Don't be satisfied with the empty forms of religion. Use them for what they are, 
avenues of experiencing the reality of Christ. Because He is the reality that your heart is longing for. And people get all kinds of religious, but stay empty. Because religion will never fill you up. Religious activities will never fill you up. Jesus says in John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me, not whoever comes to church, whoever comes to me shall not hunger. And whoever believes in me shall never thirst. If you've never been satisfied in the fullness of Christ, I hope that you'll come and receive him today. Put your religious obligations behind you and pursue Christ. Now here's the tricky part. I'm going off script here. Sorry. Here's the tricky part. It looks the same externally. Going to church, reading your Bible, praying. It looks the same. But some are seeking to earn God's approval by checking items off of their spiritual to-do list rather than doing those very same things as a way, as I said, of diving deeper into the well of living water. <clears throat> Behavior looks the same. Heart, radically different. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are drawn to man-centered religion like a moth to the flame. We are, are drawn to productivity, drawn to accomplishment, drawn to ticking items off of our to-do list. And so this is a really serious danger for the human heart. So I pray that you would do a work in us that we cannot do in ourselves, but that your Holy Spirit would open our hearts and free us from the bondage of works-based religion. Free us from the bondage of performing for you. And fill us with the freedom of the Spirit. Set us free to love you through prayer, through your word, through fellowship, through worship. Would those be avenues of, of experiencing deeper and deeper levels of grace in our hearts that we might actually be filled with power to make a difference in the world around us. Instead of being empty and powerless, striving to do what we can do, which is of no eternal value. Lord, I pray if there is anyone here who's, who's grown up in kind of a cultural Christian context where thinks that, who, who thinks that Christianity is about Christian activity, I pray that you clarify in their minds and hearts this morning that Christianity is about knowing God through Christ and experiencing God through the Holy Spirit's presence in our lives. And if there's anyone here today that needs to repent of empty religion and be filled with the presence of Christ 